Well, there's been, uh, been probably about a dozen game changers since we started this conversation. Because <laughs> they come so thick and fast. We're going to walk out into a different really? world. I mean, it's literally, you find out, you know, you buy something, yeah. and then suddenly somebody says, oh, we heard this is going to come out. And you're like, yeah. this, I've just spent that but much Do you remember back in the day when it was, okay, sound. Now we have to shoot because we've got sound. And then color came out. And then, you know, it's I nice remember, as cinema. I'm sure he remembers remember when sound came on, don't I you, Philip? I remember <laughs> very well when Jazz Singer came out, and it was like, wow, this is amazing. This is completely new. Right. Yeah, and yeah. then video sit. <laughs> You're older than me. Don't give me this crap. <laughs> uh, so, uh, did you hate or love video assist when it came out? Um, Who, if I, if I, Steve I, is I, correct, Jerry Lewis came up with that, I believe. Video um, assist. I, I heard that. Yeah, I did hear that. I don't know if it's true or not. Jerry Lewis. Jerry Lewis, the comedian. Ha ha! He came out with video assist. Yeah, because he was, wasn't it? He was directing something, and he wanted to see it, or he wanted to be able to, as a director, see the shot, you know, without having to look in the hole, or yeah, you know, that's great. right? Yeah, yeah. I long predate video assist. In fact, I remember commercials where all these people that have flown out from city, they look through the viewfinder, and they each they got like a politely maybe ten or fifteen seconds of viewfinder, so they'd have to find something to say to you know justify. Mm. Well, couldn't the micro, couldn't the napkins be bluer? Was this in advertising? Yeah, I mean, send someone out to buy blue blue napkins or so. Yeah. So I remember those days. Um, I I tend to like to be the first one on my block to new, use new new stuff. It's mm -hmm. just I I'm, I'm a little fearless on that. But on the and, set, did and, it and, cause and you problems? I, um, no, as a general rule, because I felt better communication. I told uh, the operator, yeah. I'll watch your back. Don't worry, on the right side of the frame, I'll look to see if that C-stand gets in. Mm -hmm. I'll tell the operator, show us something in rehearsal that is bolder and crazier than you might do. And so you embraced the it. And I are watching or some show. people hated it. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. And, and the operators say, well, no longer trusted and things like this. But, okay, look, let, this is a good point. When you get used to a way of working and you're a good artist and you're doing it, the great cinematographers working in film right now have no interest in digital. Why should they? Their work looks beautiful on film. Mm -hmm. They spend decades of their life learning how to control film. Perfectly. Change is scary too. They, um, it's not so much change is scary; it's unnecessary. They're getting mm -hmm. big work out of big work with great stories and major directors and artistic freedom, and they're focusing on working rather than having to learn a new medium. Mm -hmm. They're they're invested in that. My prediction is, film will last not because it looks better or much better than digital. Digital's really crowding film as far as look is concerned. Maybe it's not quite there, but it's so close. Okay, it's not necessarily cheaper or anything else like that, but, but why do you use film? I mean, I, I, love the, I love the big monitor. I love the monitor in a tent where I can see it accurately. That, that's my love of, of, of digital. Yeah. Film will last as long as the great cinematographers are able to pick, or given the opportunity to pick what medium they're doing, because why should they go out and learn a whole new medium where it's more important it's in that time of their artistic life yeah, yeah, is yeah. to be making movies, not necessarily learning new stuff. Young people can do that. Yeah. And when that generation goes, when virtually every cinematographer, mm -hmm. like Philip, mm -hmm. has, understands video and is comfortable with it, then I think that might be the death knell, knell for film. I, I probably mm -hmm. sort of represent a huge a percentage of people who probably are watching this show or who want to be, mm -hmm. you know, DPs, whatever like that, in that A, they've never touched film and B, don't want to touch film. They have no intention of it. And I think that's, you know, I think there was a point probably 10 years ago where I thought I'm going to have to, if I want to do what I want to do, I'm going to have to learn how to do film. Mm -hmm. And that kind of changed by the time yeah. I sort of like got into that position. That sort of wasn't necessarily the case mm -hmm. because I, I looked at these guys mm -hmm. and so there were some guys who, who actually are, you know, who are very successful DPs now, and they're shooting 35 mil film, who were doing the same news crap that I was doing 10 years ago. And, the, and they went, they left, and they learned the, a whole new craft. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the majority of people are never going to touch film right. because... I think we've passed that point now. Yeah, it really has. I mean, I, you know, I, I talk to people who still... I still think it should be taught in film school, though. I think it, yeah, absolutely. But, I, 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 you know, I, I don't understand the concept because I've never shot film, which excites a lot of the film guys, is that they love to, they love to shoot something and not quite know exactly what it's going to look like mm. until they get it back. I, I'm in I his camp. I, I like to see what I'm getting. I like getting. to see what I'm getting, and I can't, you know, I play clip. As soon as I've done a, a, done a take, I'm pretty well, almost certainly going to I don't know how back. you could sleep at night waiting for the dailies the next no. day. Well, ex ex except yeah, for this. Yeah, that's a terrible oh, I know, it's a terrible thing. I, I've talked to some career first assistants, great focus assistants, and I had a revelation years ago when I sat over a beer or something with a guy and he said, 
I can visualize every lens from 17 to 150, and I'm working on the one like that, and I can see the stops, and I can see the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the focus depth, and in their mind, if you put a lens and you put a stop on there and all that, they knew what was the edge of focus, they, and they could see it. It's like being yeah. a savant so, of some sort. Exactly, so they had developed a thing because looking next to the, standing next to the camera pulling focus, mm -hmm. they can't look at a monitor, and they've got to know, ooze the focus there on that syllable because that's when the eye is going to do it. I mean, this is a fine, fine art. Mm -hmm. And I said, don't you ever want to operate and look at it? And they look horrified. No, this was the world they got in, and they were, they were great at it. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. On film, there's a point where you're not nervous about it. There's a point where your eye is set and you're not worried about the next thing. And again, in the old days, I guess I'm the old critter here, but uh, the <laughs> old days, you would shoot film, you get film dailies. And I gotta tell you, you shoot a feature film and you make all those decisions and judgments and a tiny piece of film right there and let's put this in or whatever like that. And in less than 24 hours, the next morning at six in the morning or something, you're seeing a 35 millimeter print yeah. on a laboratory calibrated projector seeing exactly. So you get to the point where your tiny filtration and things, I mean, you're, you're, you nail it. You can yeah. call it printer light. Yeah. And learning that, I mean, that's the way, that was the way that, uh, you know, it, it's a whole different craft level. Well, the way that I... And, and it's beautiful. The way that mm -hmm. I tell people now, the people who come to me and like, you know, how can I be better at what I do, is I, I give them my way of getting, got, the way I got better at what I did. And because I'd gone through the whole sort of news thing, documentary thing, where I was using ENG lenses, which made your life so easy. Mm -hmm. You could just zoom and change whatever you want, a piece of cake. Yeah. As soon as I got my first depth of field adapter and started using <laughs> prime lenses, that changed everything. Mm. I had to learn almost from scratch. What so a file of focus was? Everything, yeah. yeah. And it wasn't until um, I, I went down that route that my game changed from there to there. Because, mm. And I really think that's an important thing to do because it's a whole new principle. It, it makes you think about things and see things. We're using way. selective focus. As using a selective focus as a story telling tool. Yeah. You n knowing where you need to be positioned, rather than like, oh, I could, if I stand there, I can get that. Mm -hmm. Because you, modern cameras with their video, their zoom lenses, make things late. People make people lazy. Yeah. And it wasn't. Do you use peaking? Do I use peaking sometimes? <laughs> yeah, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> not, on, not. I on, do. I do. Well, not not on, not on my uh, my digital SLRs because I haven't got any. <laughs> but well, I, but it has really improved me. And I and I say this to so many people. I say, okay, right. You know, it's it's you know, you've got this camera. You want to be a DP. You want to shoot stuff. Get a depth of field adapter. Get a DSLR. Mm. And you know, shoot with prime lenses. Well, why can't I just buy a zoom lens that does it all for me? No, forget about that. Get your prime lenses because mm -hmm. you will learn discipline. And I think that's the best advice I give to anybody, is you've got to go down that route, because it, it changes the whole way you see everything. Mm -hmm. And it's not quite, it's not going down the film route, but at least it's as close to, a, you know, in a digital world as we can get to that with that discipline. Yeah. Definitely. Um, so sort of getting back to these fast and furious coming game changers, mm -hmm. um, how, as, as, as a DP now, how do you handle that? I mean, how, I mean, you, you're great at it. You, you just suck in every new thing that comes, it seems like, and can handle it. I but that right. is I'm disturbing, and you know, to probably to a lot of people, there's just now the next new camera, let alone just <laughs> accumulating gear in your I'm, closet. I'm begging Sony. Uh, I had to give my EX3 back. They took it back, which uh, yeah. well, they did it. I mean, I didn't own it, you know. I yeah. thought, you know, and I said, okay, but I want to be, uh, I want to be Philip Bloom. I want to be a beta tester. I want to be one of the first people getting the next generation. But I've, you know, I've, I've got, uh, you know, I've got an EX3 now, and I've pimped it out. The crap now. It's now it now powers off of of big V lock batteries. Yeah. Um, I'm getting a, you know I've got nano flash. I'm recording in in a, you know a better codec, and it's an amazing camera now. You know it's an absolutely amazing camera. But I'm really I was really quite surprised when to hear that you know you're really big into your EX ones and EX threes because you know you are a guy who's been brought up on film. The fact that you love those is really quite. It's, it's actually quite. It's a very film look. It, I mean to it, me, it just not, the it's look a, grabbed me. It's only because the look. The look I said, ooh, this is gorgeous. This is what I there's expect. A, there's a lot of people out there who are. I would say film snobs, sure. And they would, you know, the thirty-five mm. megabit second, four to zero. Oh, right. I'm not touching that camera. And you know, the fact that somebody like you has, has embraced that is, you know, well, actually really exciting. Was, uh, and of course, you used it as things, well. Right? Yeah, yeah. We had her cut seamlessly. Was it on the end of the guns when they were shooting there? No, that was actually uh, what was that? That was a little HF100 on yeah. there for oh, yeah. pure weight on, on the gun cam stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that's a very quick thing. Also, there's yeah. about you know maybe. 
20, 25 frames before the guy fires, mm -hmm. and the whole thing goes right. out the window anyways sure. with yeah. the concussion. Um, where, where were you using the EX3s? The EX3s we were using for all the documentary footage, for mm -hmm. uh, any, any time that I was on the security cameras as the MNU uh, cameraman, I had an EX3 right. because a red wouldn't make yeah. sense. Uh, the main speed. character's interview and all that business, yeah. right? Well, okay, yeah. 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 Lens-wise, what are you using on the EX3? Uh, I actually never used an EX3. I only had an EX1. I, oh, and I actually, sorry. it's my personal EX1 oh, that was great. on the job. So you're actually yeah. using the stock lens. Oh, yeah. 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 That's yeah. great. I've got I had an EX3 on second unit, but that never came over to That's us. great. You, you know, use a stock lens. Why are you correcting okay, okay. me on that? I didn't know. I thought, it, I mean, it's the same imagery. Yeah. I, I have yeah. a little time lapse film called Satori. We have a place up in British Columbia, and the, the sun sets and the light there, it's a confluence of five waterways. I mean, it's just gorgeous, with sometimes clouds blowing this way and this way, and inner doing it. I mean, and um, I shot it on the EX1. I, I had, you know, just gotten the EX1. My AFI students said, oh, then we can't use the original lens on it. They've got to have DigiPrimes or something like that. They looked at it, and it's sharp and crisp and all the light and everything. So that's the original lens. They hadn't even tried it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I put a 20-millimeter uh, DigiPrime on an EX3 for a, uh, I think, a DV Expo or show, one of the things like that. Onto the X3, mm -hmm. I took the HDSDI out, uncompressed 422 10-bit. I put it straight into the back of a Barco 2K projector with no encoding, anything else, you know, on a 40-foot screen, your jaw would have dropped. I, I, I mean, I had a beautiful big Chinese lantern and a pretty model and all that, mm -hmm. but oh my God, what that sensor can do if you don't, if you, you know, if you put a lens on the other thing and mm -hmm. take that out. So we know what your favorite camera is. What about you these days? My camera, it, it really can change um, yeah. whatever comes out yeah. next. I mean, I am very much sort of like the next big thing I will, I will be Fair begging enough. people to get, uh, I want to try, try, I want to try it. So, you know, mm -hmm. uh, actually, the only thing is when the 5D came out, 5D Mark II, I was very slow with that. I saw that and uh, like I saw 30p and went. Mm. I'm there right now. I'm yeah. still there right yeah. now yeah. myself. But also, until the firmware fixed, yeah. you could not take it off mm -hmm. auto. And here's what would happen to that. You'd start to a move. Yeah. The auto exposure would change the exposure. <laughs> that would stop the processor, and the thing would freeze frame for three frames while the processor worked, and then skip ahead. Well, that's why so when I got it, I used I used Nikon Zeiss glass on that, and he's yeah, exposure lock, right. and yeah. I got round it. Yeah. Whereas I knew guys who were slipping the lenses off slightly, so mm -hmm. the contacts weren't being made. Of course, oops, excuse me. Lucky, that, oh, I just broken oh, the glass. Nice, first time that ever. Okay, we just we just want to notice this. Just a second. Uh, I want to make sure we get this. This 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 is the Philip. It's quite beautiful. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. It's quite beautiful, don't you think? It's, this is the Philip Bloom effect. Uh, I was going to say it's almost like a Philip Glass. Don't eat any of that. Can you imagine what would have happened if I actually had uh, the apple martini? <laughs> that would have been like the third or fourth glass. Uh, I don't know. Do you, you yeah. do you have a, a favorite, or, or what do you prefer I, to shoot on? I don't have a favorite. I don't have. It's a per project. It, it is per project, and, and it's mine is too. Even though you wanted to lay the X3 on me, I love it yeah. because it democratizes things. I mean, it's the first time that anybody without a studio or a network or corporate suits mm -hmm. can get quality like that, right. and that that's why I love it. But it's not. I mean, you use the right tool. What, what, which one do you think is more significant? I mean, now we, we should bring it up to DSLRs now, it, but yeah, there's... I, mean, prob <coughs> I think, for, you know, the DSLR at the moment is probably, even though it's, it's incredibly awkward to use and it's hugely flawed, the concept well. of it, everything about it is, uh, is annoying. So, so you think that's one of the bigger game changes? I think it's probably the, one of the biggest game changes purely because you suddenly, out of the blue, have this huge sensor that's mm. capable of these incredible images with f huge flaws. But the concept of it is a massive game changer. Yeah, I don't think there's going to be any going back.